So hello everyone. Uh, sorry for making you wait a little bit, but uh, these seven days at IEEE VR event was uh, quite um, intensive for many of us. So we have um, very interesting topics today and panelists from the directly the organizers of the uh, journals, papers and workshops. And we would love to hear their um, recap because it is a seven day event, not everyone has enough time or maybe because of time zone situation as uh, Kent, I saw that you also mentioned on Discord. I think it's great that we make it as accessible as possible. So this is the goal of this panel. Uh, there will be also uh, a lot of time uh, allocation for Q&A. So after our panelists are giving their recap, we would love to hear more about uh, questions or anything you are curious about that you have missed at the IEEE event. And personally, I am also a very long uh, time member of IEEE, uh, I think more than uh, 15 years and since my student times and uh, we are really giving um, a lot of um, value what IEEE is uh, doing not only for VR, AR industry but throughout the whole uh, technological advancements and we are really happy to, to be partnering and supporting IEEE with different scholarships and uh, partnerships. So a very quick introduction about why we are doing this event and who are we. Um, let me quickly go through it. So uh, before that, uh, let me also share the agenda. First, we will have a, a fireside chat uh, till 1.30 p.m. PT. We will have an, an hand physics lab creators which I will also mention that they are also our uh, trainers in some of our classes. Uh, and we have the recap panel. And afterwards, uh, like after like 90 minutes, we will also continue the discussion on Clubhouse and it will be also um, broadcasted to Discord channel a server we have. I think our team is right now uh, probably writing the links of Clubhouse and Discord so you can also join there if you have enough energy left or if you want to continue the discussion in a much more um, a smaller um, a group. So um, who we are? XR Bootcamp. We are a global online academy, upskilling academy for VR AR development. And we are creating in-depth learning classes, uh, advanced programs for VRAR professionals, researchers, and uh, for any enthusiast who would like to master their VRAR skills with real-world industry projects. I will not so much go into detail, but we have beginner level, but advanced level courses. Today, since everyone is very well uh, equipped with VRAR skills, we will just go through a little bit of uh, what we are doing on the advanced part. So um, uh, we have um, lots of different professionals joining to our program and our aim is to help them for their next XR project <coughs> or these kind of companies. And um, for this year and next year, what we have seen with the help of our advisory board is a standalone VR, AR, mixed reality headsets uh, is becoming more, <clears throat> more and more standard for the industry. So uh, we created programs based on the pain points and based on the um, in-demand skills requirements of the industry, uh, focusing on three main pillars, lifelike interactions, high performance software architecture, and uh, performance-based smoothly running uh, experience with uh, top quality. So I will not so much go to detail, but the reason that we are here today is actually um, also um, uh, a little bit giving an, a round of applause to, to, to the team behind Hand Physics Lab. They are actually the creators of Advanced VR Interactions class uh, with um, a different kind of uh, programs, which I will go into a little bit detail on that. And we have rendering optimization for standalone VRAR devices, 
And for the performance code side, we have data-oriented programming approach. So all these classes is actually, some of them are on April, starting on April, May, and on summertime. So anyone interested, we have a lot, already a lot of researchers who are joining our class. Happy to see you there as well. And um, regarding the advanced weird interactions class, uh, we are teaching different uh, lifelike interaction skills from physics space interaction to tele teleportation, locomotion, um, and also immersed kinematics as well, which locomotion is already, and some of the topics will already be part of today's panel. And our team uh, who created this class, Roger and Dennis is with us today, and we will have a, a, a short fireside chat with them uh, shortly. And uh, let me uh, share the uh, maybe first two minutes of our, the highlights video to give you an idea. I hope that the sound is coming. Hello and welcome to the viral deep dive. So with this class, we will uh, teach you multiple aspects of hand tracking, but it, if it does a double pinch, a little sphere gets created. So we want to detect a double pinch. How to implement the locomotion system you will do with hand tracking. But it's always relative to the center of, the, of your tracking space you will use to create that curve, both directly with touching it with your fingers, quickly build that you can interact with it and make it fully interactive and responsive. For example, we will start with like the hand UI to use pinching gesture to expand those parts dynamically. Dot product and how it works and what kind of value you can use to detect those events. So let's have a closer look at the actual implementation. Uh, we wanted to move on the z-axis, so we have to define it here. When I can grab one, so as you can see here, when they lie on the table are fully physics-based, as soon as you grab them, you can even throw it in, and it goes directly in. It's all automatic. Even if you hold an object now, you actually can still interact with the world. Different kind of joints, we will uh, go through them, all of them, and see where they can be used. That piece is detected. Put it in the trash can. Boom. Today is a deep dive with Tom. So we're going to be specifically talking about the business uh, and future of hand interaction technology. AI OPEC, principal researcher at Microsoft, is with us. Uh, we are excited to have you today. Uh, we're very, very grateful for Chris, Hannah, and John to be on with us to give a little more of a deep dive uh, into some of the specific use cases. We use the haptics and the hand tracking to relax people and to calm them down and make it a a pleasant environment to be when we're stuck in traffic, so. And what do I mean by fit the environment? We can look at different parameters, such as the color. We can see that the screen might have information that I need there. We took that and built out our first multiplayer in the office at the time in Palo Alto, and I would not you. And we started saying, can we get two people in a space to share objects? And of course, I need to display them in the language of the game because just showing that there was a sofa in the spaceship will break immersion. So that was really the aim of the demo, but also, yeah, to show the what hand tracking can do and how you can kind of have more of a spatial um, interaction. Fabric seems to have a hard time. As soon as we remove the restrictions, all of them react quite nicely. Very interesting little creatures so that you can go to them, grab them, and then dynamically put them back in the trash can. If you have the joystick to control the position of the robotic arm, you have a trigger to activate the pincher. Let's have a look at the hologram control system. Really uh, like fine control of the robot. Okay, I will uh, quickly go to the uh, next slide. Yeah, uh, today we have um, a quick fireside chat with, uh, with uh, Roger and Dennis before Going, uh, passing over to Kant and uh, Holonetic team. I will show the trailer to give you a context for those who haven't heard of Hand Physics Lab because it's just launched yesterday. Thank you. 
Perfect. So um, from my side, uh, these are the quick introduction of uh, XR Bootcamp and Roger and Dennis. Hello, Roger, Dennis. I hope that you can hear us. So I will leave the stage to Kent and uh, Roger, Dennis, uh, to uh, a little bit talk about hand tracking and the recent announcements from different uh, companies. Um, happy to hear more about your game and uh, what you think about hand tracking and advanced interactions. Great. So yeah, my name is Kent Bai. I do the Voices of VR podcast and uh, actually was attending a lot of the IEEE VR um, this past week. And uh, it's because of that, I and I haven't uh, downloaded the previous version of the Hand Physics Lab, but I did just try it out for about uh, 20 minutes or so. Get, <laughs> was able to get through about 20 of the different puzzles or whatnot. So maybe you could first uh, talk about like, when did this first come out? Because it didn't first get released on um, the uh, side quest, or maybe you could just talk about like when did it first come out? Um, hi, so um, actually it came out just um, after uh, Facebook introduced uh, the hand tracking feature on the Oculus Quest, like directly on the built-in device they introduced uh, in 2019, if, if I'm correct. And not too long after that, they introduced hand tracking as well, which was not, was not really something new in the industry because it was already introduced by, by Leap Motion, then Ultra Leap, then HoloLens, also HTC. But the, the, the great factor that was there is that it was all in a built-in device that a lot of people already added. So it, it made a lot of sense to try to build something with hand tracking because a lot, there was already a big audience for it. And SideQuest allowed to really put there an, an experimental application and see if the audience would actually react positively to it. Uh, positively to it. It would really allow to build many different experiences and see uh, how they would actually appreciate that, how they could actually, uh, how, how would they uh, interact with hand tracking and see how they would actually feel about it. Yeah, I think the main worry was uh, in the beginning that hand tracking is not perfect and it's still not, right? We're still in the in the beginning, even though uh, for Leap Motion or Ultra Leap, it started way back when, um, it's still limited uh, where you can use the hands. So the SideQuest gave us a good estimation of how someone which is maybe not a developer, not a researcher can use hand tracking for a more playful experience and do they really like it? And the response has been tremendously positive from there. So um, then we decided to actually spend more time in actually making a full experience for you know the everyday um, VR headset user instead of like more the researcher developer type of experiences, which we first like introduced uh, those experiences to. Yeah, as I went through it, I, I uh, really appreciated the small kind of tech demo feel to it where you're kind of revealing the things that you can do with hand tracking with a, a series of different puzzles and interactions and, um, you know, picking up moving options and uh, moving objects around and just trying to get a feel of what you can start to do with the hand tracking. And I, and I like how you start to play with that a little bit. Like uh, the first time I really noticed that I think was like the floppy hands where it's now all of a sudden I got used to having these virtual hands. Now you're degrading them in some ways. And I found it had like a really interesting psychological effect as I'm like thinking that these are my hands. And then all of a sudden they're kind of like floppy or they're not functional is that, and it almost has like this interesting feedback loop. And I'm just curious if you could maybe expand upon those different types of uh, phenomena that you were discovering with the hand tracking and how that was impacting your experience of the hands. Yes, that, that's the beauty of hand tracking because it introduced an additional layer of immersion, the, the ability to be able to see your, your fingers uh, for real in VR. Uh, you will, you can really have the, the ability now to trick your brain even further to make you feel it's real because you see your hand and what you see in VR, even though they can be virtual fingers or anything else, that you will, the, the fact that you move your fingers and you see them moving and reacting, the, the, the proprioception we have uh, will really make you believe, okay, that's real, that's way more immersive. But the, the, the funny part is that you can also extend that and really play with that to, to break the, that feeling and try to see how far you can extend it uh, and see if you can really create interesting experience. One of the first uh, funny prototype about that was the ability to be able to detach your hand and make them then fall on the table and see how, how you can react to that. And it's really funny to see that you, you, your hand is being detached, but you still can control your fingers, you can move around, you can even walk up to some point with your hand. 
And that really creates a very interesting um, a feeling in your mind when you see that. It was, uh, yeah, the, also when you just using physics, the, the very first prototype was just about using physics and see how your brain would uh, react and feel that uh, to the fact that if you use physics on fingers and you can interact with virtual physics based object, and you see your fingers are bending backward or your arm is also bending backward, uh, that really created a, a very interesting feeling of immersion. Yeah, and it was tried to build that it starts very simple, right? You push a button. So we basically try to teach a user how to use hand tracking because it's still limited in the technology. It's not feels like the real world. It's there's still some kind of a learning curve. So in the beginning, it starts very gentle but towards the end, you have to do mind bending things where your hands are inversed or you play with yourself with the clone and you have solved solve puzzles with um, yourself, but everything is mirrored and you have to basically always think in the inverse way to you know, really trick the brain because that's something you cannot experience in the real world. And I think hasn't been able to be experienced in that way before because now you have hand tracking with the guys to have all everything in one headset available to a lot of people to get those experiences. And that is one of the fascinating things about it because your brain might react in a different way than others. We had some people which reacted very strongly uh, to certain sensations which were there, right? It felt like haptic feedback, although there was none, just because the brain was apparently so immersed that they felt haptic feedback where there was none. And that is something which we don't experience as strongly anymore because we got used to it, but maybe some others will which experience it for the first time. Yeah, the other thing I want to just call out is the type of user interface innovations that you're doing here in terms of uh, navigating the menus and button pressing. And it's almost like a long press, you know, you have to put your finger there. And I think in some sense, like I found that the hand tracking was a little glitchy in the sense that there was like, I was expecting it to be like more immersive or more better. And I imagine that that is something that could probably improve over time, but yet like little user affordance conceits of like in order to push a button, you have to stick your finger there for long enough. I imagine that's in part because people may be accidentally clicking buttons if you don't like have it pushed long enough because the tracking may glitch out and you don't want to have people accidentally go somewhere they didn't intend. And so there's sort of like this trade-off between as the tracking gets better, then I imagine some of those kind of user interface uh, things will get better and optimized so that you can have more of a, you know, like I, I intend to do this and that happens. I don't know if you've found that like over time that the tracking has been getting better already, or if you feel like it, it still has a long ways to go to, to make it feel like you're really, really, really immersed in the experience. Yes, uh, the hand tracking has definitely improved since the very first iteration of the first prototype that we had January in 2020. Uh, it was, yeah. It was it was already there, but it was really like if you lose tracking, it was it was very gimmicky. But the, after many many updates, the hand tracking now is is almost fully usable by anyone. Uh, you can say it really feels good, and it will keep probably getting better, even with software updates or hardware updates. It will keep getting better. And yeah, one of the main aspects to take uh, into account for any hand tracking app is uh, what happened with the hand tracking gets bad. What happens to the hand and how do you prevent uh, anything that the user doesn't intend to, especially false positive and UI interaction that it doesn't press the button if the user doesn't want that or doesn't do something specific that should happen if the user does a specific hand gesture, for example, opening the menu, they're doing a long press, resetting himself. That should always be a combination of multiple hand gestures that it's very unlikely or should never happen if the user doesn't intend to do that. For example, opening a menu. It should be a combination of your your the palm of your hand facing in a specific direction. Like looking, if you look at your hand, basically you can know okay the palm is facing my way. And if you do then a pinch or a specific hand gesture, then you have a combination of multiple hand gestures that you would never do if you just want to like interact or grab an object to prevent any false positive. So a lot of like iteration and prototyping was put into the UI to really try to make it the best possible by also having a lot of testers and see how they would react, see that they, if they try to grab an object, they don't open or do a specific gesture at the same time to prevent all those frustrating moments or false positive of input. Yeah, and I think a lot of effort was also put into um, trying to do the thing a user might expect because you 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 have a limited tracking error, right? We, we know as soon as the hands go out of you, you cannot know what happens to them. So what would the user expect then to happen? And we still, 
uh, will improve on that to make it maybe more obvious to a user because we have to teach them that hand tracking is not perfect somehow during the experience. And it is definitely very challenging because if you don't see the hand and you hold an object in your hand, would you, and then you let go, but you let go of the object while your, the camera doesn't see your hand, uh, what is the natural thing you would expect to happen? And currently it's that you actually still hold the, the object when you look back at the hand and you're still holding it. Because when the cameras don't track it, you cannot know that the user actually let go. We tried different iterations, right? Where you let go everything as soon as you don't look anymore, the hand is not anymore tracked, but that usually did led to more problematic scenarios than when you just basically freeze the hand and keep it exactly in the position it was when the hand was still visible. So there's a lot of iteration and just trial and error and testing and seeing how users interact, which goes on to find a compromise where in most scenarios you will get the intended behavior, but it's still not perfect, right? Because we would need to have external tracking like the lighthouses were before, where in any scenario, everything is perfectly tracked, then you can really do it. Now we have to live with the compromise and try to do the best guesstimate of what feels natural and intuitive to the user when things are not perfectly tracked. Great. Well, we're, we're coming up at the, the end, uh, the top of the hour or the uh, half of the hour here. Uh, so the last question I wanted to ask, uh, and by the way, I, wanted, I would love to maybe have you uh, on the Voices of VR podcast after I have a chance to really dive in and play the whole experience. Like I said, this came out yesterday and I was at IEEE all week and I haven't had my a chance to totally immerse myself, but I highly recommend people check it out if you haven't yet. But just as a, a final question, um, you know, one of the things that I noticed is that when you're like moving an object, you're like, you, you're able to kind of like um, have your hand, but then the actual virtual representation hasn't moved. And then you're moving your actual hand. So it makes it feel like you're kind of like pushing heavy objects. I thought that was a really interesting conceit and I don't have you made like a mapping of all these kind of like gameplay type of mechanics that you um, can do I mean imagine you have them kind of out within uh, these little demos of the puzzles that you have but if you've kind of mapped out the different types of gameplay or interactions you can start to do with your hands if you have like a conceptual framework for kind of understanding those different types of uh, playing with uh, uh, different ways to kind of leave the virtual hand over here and, and have these effects of making it feel like you're pushing a heavy object even though you're not. I think that the best way to illustrate how that could become like a, a framework or like some clear guidelines how to design UI for hand tracking if you want to have realistic physics is just to try to map what we know, what we learn from the real environment, from how we learn that a heavy object, uh, we have a hard time to lift it. Or if you, if you try to lift a heavy object, you will have a hard time because you don't have enough spring in your muscle. And uh, the, the core concept to map that in VR and try to make it feel that an object is heavy is just to try to replicate what you expect to happen. If you try to, to, to push against a virtual wall and everything is phys physics-based, well, you should see that your arm will bend backward and you will be pushed away. Uh, instead of just being a ghost and just going through the wall, you really need, if you push hard on a wall, it will push your whole body away. So your camera rig in a virtual space will be pushed as well. Yeah. So the, 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 the core aspect here is just try to make uh, interaction that will mimic reality or mimic how we expect reality to be and put that into interaction in VR. Yeah, and often, um, I mean, what you probably observed is that your real hands are not the same position as the virtual hands, right? You basically need to disassociate the, the tracked information from the rep virtual representation. And one of the very inspiring talks, which we can only recommend is like Valve created the door talk. Um, you can find them on YouTube where they um, went through, I don't know how, long, how much time they spent, but they went through so many iterations to make a door feel natural in VR. And it's completely mind blowing when you hear what they tried and what they experiment and what they came up with. It's extremely inspirational because they went through um, so many testers and you know presented different ways and then they interviewed them, what they remembered of what they were doing and it's not at all what you expect. So what they found out is like, if you visually have, you just move your hand forward, but then visually the hand turns in the virtual world. Most testers reported that they turned the knob on the door, although they didn't in reality. So you could see that the visual cortex basically overcharges what your proprioception would tell you where your hand is. And those kind of mind tricks um, is very important when you try to build a, a physics-based experience because you should not do what you 
actually have from the data standpoint, you should basically have a virtual world which maps the physics correctly and then try to get close to the reality hands, but respect the physical limitations because that feels more natural. Although it's when you look from the outside, it doesn't feel natural because you actually have a, you know, a certain delay or a certain distance between the real world hand and the virtual hand, but actually it feels more natural because your brain is used to the correct physical reaction and expects it also in the virtual world. Awesome. Well, I think that's probably a good place to stop and maybe transition over into the IEEE digest and recap. Um, there is a question that if you if the if you want to dive into the Q and A, uh, the Hall and Alex team, uh, there's some people asking some pretty specific questions that maybe you could uh, answer there. But let's move over into the IEEE VR conference kind of recap. Um, so this is my fifth IEEE VR. I've gone to three in real life ones and two virtual ones now, um, and so. Uh, whenever I go to these conferences, I, there's always so much going on, and I'm really excited actually to have a chance to talk to uh, all the different folks that are involved with it to kind of get the conference buzz. Uh, one of the hardest things I think to get uh, in these conferences when they're virtual is like what the buzz is and what people are talking about. Um, and so uh, first, I'd love to have each of you introduce yourself and maybe uh, talk a bit about like what part of the IEEE uh, VR conference you may have been helping to organize uh, if you're doing conference uh, tracks or sessions, or that would just help me to kind of get a, a orientation to see what lens that you had within this conference. So yeah, maybe we could uh, just uh, go down uh, and each person can introduce themselves and uh, we'll start uh, with whoever wants to go first and then we'll go from there. Would you like my stuff first? Yep, go ahead. Yeah. Hello everyone, this is Craig Yu from uh, Josh Mason University. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at Josh Mason and I co-organized the training XR workshop at the uh, Attribute VR 2021 uh, together with my colleagues uh, at uh, Purdue and uh, University of Central Florida. So this is a full day workshop. Uh, this is the second time we organized this workshop uh, basically, we accepted uh, 10 papers, so we have 10 paper presentations, followed by three keynote talks uh, by, you know, very famous researchers in the field who, who do uh, VR training. Yep. Awesome. So, yep. Great, thank you. Uh, Tab I'll just start calling out names. Tabitha, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? All right, th thank you for calling out names. You, you got us past the awkward, who's next on Zoom. Um, so hi, I'm Dr. Tabitha Peck. I'm a professor um, in the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science at Davidson College, which is near Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I was a member of the journal paper. I was a journal paper chair this year. So I was responsible for, um, uh, with, my great colleagues um, to organize the journal papers. So we went through all 161 submissions, um, organized the program committee. Um, thank you to everyone who was on that program committee, um, organized the reviewers. Thank you to all of the reviewers um, and got those uh, 161 submissions down to 25 papers that were accepted. Um, and then there's the additional 92 papers for the conference track. Um, so I was very involved in the um, in the research paper part of the conference. Okay, great. And uh, Susan, oh wait, you're muted. I don't know, or uh, or your mic isn't set up. Maybe you could. We'll swing back here in a second. I'm I'm on. There you go. There you go. Okay, now we can hear you. Yeah, I'm I'm on my phone um, with the audio, so. Uh, hi, thank you. It's uh, wonderful to be here. I'm with the Open Air Cloud, and we put together a tutorial on open spatial computing. And our goal was to uh, twofold was to get our technology out into the world and people building on our platform. And then also it catalyzed a lot of the work that the team was doing in terms of uh, creating documentation and testing and experimenting ourselves in preparation for the tutorial. And the one thing that we did, I think that was unique was 
we took advantage of the whole week and our main tutorial sessions were on the first day. And then today we did our last session where the participants came back and showed what they built and we provided asynchronous support throughout the week. And so that was something that uh, worked really well for the participants and they were happy to have that additional support. Awesome, thank you. And uh, Dr. Marr. Hi everyone. Um, I was uh, uh, on the program committee this year, uh, review quite a lot of papers and uh, also put forward a workshop uh, on locomotion. And uh, I'll be happy to talk more about it. And I think one of the things uh, that IEEE VR has been growing lately is the um, the side tracks, right? Like the tutorials, the workshops. And, and I think that that's uh, super nice because it gives some more interactive space. Awesome. And uh, Stefania. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Stefania Serafina. I'm a professor at Tolbuk University in Copenhagen in Denmark. And uh, I was one of the co-organizers of the Sonic Interactions in Virtual Environments workshop. It took place the Saturday morning, so the first day of the conference. And we had uh, several papers that are looking at the role of sound in VR. And, and uh, also we had demos and the uh, immersive music sessions. OK. Uh, is that everybody? I know there's other people here up on stage, but that, that was, I think, the, the people who were on camera. Um, OK. I think it's everybody. So uh, I think whenever I, I think I actually had a, a chat with you, uh, Tabitha, during the week because I was trying to be like, okay, what's what's new? Because you're you're looking at all these different things and actually uh, written down here what you had said, which is that uh, looking at some of the different trends that you saw this year, you said that the number of sessions around avatars was increasing. Uh, certainly locomotion's a big topic. Uh, virtual humans uh, was also a big topic. Uh, more talks about plausibility and presence, I think within the community that uh, we're starting to talk about that. And then um, some new sessions around drones, drones teleoperation, as well as um, interactions and pens. So I'm just curious if you could maybe comment on some of these sort of sections and trends. Like there are some of these topics, like I said, that they've been there, but there's also new emerging topics that we're starting to see as well. So I'd just be curious to hear, maybe we would start there and then start to dig, uh, spread out into the, some of these other uh, areas. Um, yeah, so uh, it, you kind of did a nice little summary of everything that really kind of went on at the conference. Um, I, I think some interesting, interesting trends that are happening is um, locomotion kind of continues to be a pretty big research area um, and uh, redirected walking, which is um, near and dear to my heart because it's a topic I've always kind of worked in. Um, and just a lot of work kind of looking at these thresholds um, and trying to better understand what are kind of the ways you can manipulate um, and get away with manipulating the environment such that people don't understand this or don't see it. Um, and that was very related to what you were just talking about with, um, with the hand tracking of what are kind of these perceptual thresholds and how can you manipulate the environment such that you're kind of tricking the user into behaving um, or feeling like they're behaving the way you want them to in these environments. Um, so that seems to be a pretty big topic that kind of keeps growing and looking at more, more ways of doing this within hands, within walking, within it, manipulating the environments um, and things like that. Um, and then another topic that I really see as growing um, is really in the avatars of virtual humans and embodiment realm. So there's lots of stuff in terms of how do you interact with um, an environment? So how do you actually interact with people? This is becoming really important right now when we're in a pandemic and we can't see people physically, but you can go into virtual world. So how do you actually communicate with avatars? Um, there is an entire panel um, on what makes uh, what makes a virtual human human um, and what are the things that you should do around that as well as a lot of research um, within how do you interact with these avatars. Um, and then there's an entire other area of kind of the psychological implications of avatars. So if you are, if you have a self avatar and it's different from you, 
how do you actually respond to it? How might it change you? How might it affect you? Um, and we saw this both in papers and in panels um, as kind of a theme throughout the conference. Yeah, I wanted to, to call out the, the keynote by Frank Steinecke because he, I think, dove into a lot of those like perceptual engineering or each phase of the perception, cognition, and then the action, like ways in which that you could modulate those through the technology to be able to do things like the redirected walking. Um, and yeah, just overall, uh, really impressed with a lot of the different um, kind of frontier experimentations that uh, he was showing there and blended agents and having mixed reality agents and self-moving balls and lots of really exotic stuff that I hadn't seen before. So that was nice to see. But let's, I wanted to move to, to Dr. Uh, Mark Gonzalez Franco because uh, talking about locomotion uh, as a big topic and since that's a, a something that you were looking at, just curious to hear what you know, some of the different, um, you know, things were highlights for you, what was new or what was striking for, you know, these uh, sessions that you had on locomotion? Yeah, I think there is clearly, everybody would agree, is one of the challenges, right, that spaces in VR are much bigger than the spaces in reality. Uh, and matching these two things is complicated. Um, I think Tabitha's work on redirected walking is, uh, you know, one of the many possible ways in which we're going to start having solutions. Um, few of the things that we were talking in the workshop, uh, first, it was a, a good place to give a space for this research. It's traditionally quite hard to publish a, um, a locomotion work in, in VR because, um, you know, if you're trying to establish things like a motion sickness or, you know, it's even hard to run the experiments. So I think it's good to have a side tracks in which people feel comfortable to, to share in, inside just the community of locomotion, uh, even the smaller experiments. A few of the things that uh, came out on the, on the workshop uh, were related to this exponential growth we're seeing on techniques. Um, we talked a lot about the locomotion bolt, which is this new tool that is an interactive database where you can see techniques and it has over a hundred of them. Um, so you really see how big this is and how do you compare one against another and which one is better. Uh, and it's critical also for developers, right? We had a couple of developers there um, and they, they don't even get accepted into the store if their game creates motion sickness right, uh, beyond that level that is also kind of arbitrary because there is no way, there is no benchmark currently against which uh, you can test your technique. Um, and then there was also this idea of accessibility, right? It's very linked to accessibility, um, which technique you can use or not. And some techniques are very easy for accessible, right? Like with controllers but then they lose on every other aspect of this embodied experience. So how can we have something that works in all ways? Um, so all of these things, and, and I think it was very interesting discussion. I think the community is gonna keep growing. Um, and we're seeing these new techniques, new taxonomies, new everything, right? People are interested on this problem. Yeah, a quick follow-up question and comment, which is that um, I know that within the industry of virtual reality, there's a number of different options that people can either do like teleportation or smooth locomotion and click turns. You know, there's like some emerging standards in terms of like if a game becomes popular enough, then there's different tolerances that happen within the community. And one of the things that I wonder about, something I've actually personally experienced, which is that at the, when I first started VR, uh, any sort of uh, smooth locomotion would make me really motion sick. But I think over time, I've been able to accommodate uh, something about like, I've been able to maybe train my body a little bit to get like what is maybe a controversial idea of these VRC legs, where you can almost like, you know, do the smooth locomotion. And maybe there's ways that, you know, that you can sort of blur out the peripheral vision to maybe help do that. You know, there's ways that you have those accessibility options, but yet at some point, now that I don't need those little guardrails, sometimes I get annoyed when I go into an experience and I can't have that smooth locomotion. 
because they've said, no, only you can do teleportation when it's like, oh, well, I, I can't, I don't have to uh, do, the, I, I can, I can withstand and tolerate the smooth locomotion and, and take, so, it makes me less present. So yeah, I'd be curious to hear if yeah, there's no. any research to kind of prove that out uh, or if it's just really up to individuals or, you know, so just some I comments. I think here what we're seeing from the empirical side also is that uh, we're moving towards a world in which users will be led to choose their technique to move around, okay? And we can see it on Alex already. There are at least three locomotion techniques in Alex. You can sort of teleport, you can interact in first person, you can, and I feel like that's gonna be more the trend. So I feel like we have a challenge now to um, create, okay, all these techniques should become a passport and you as a user, you bring them to your games. And then certain games say, okay, I'm only compatible with 50 of them or with 30 because, right? Like if you're on a shooter game, you don't want people teleporting because then what, where is the fun, right? Um, if any, <laughs> but what I mean is that uh, we have to consider the user, as you say, some users will have some preferences and developers also spend a lot of effort on developing techniques and reinventing the wheel. Academics are also reinventing the wheel every time they wanna do some uh, redirected walking, they have to, half of it is implementing the technique. Um, and I feel like all of that are challenges that are better discussed in, in workshop type of scenarios than on a conference paper with three minutes for, uh, or five minutes for questions, right? Um, so, um, and I feel like we're gonna move around there. We can see the community is really clear that there are too many things to be evaluated. And it's, it's wild right now, it's the wild west. So we need to have benchmarkings, we need to have uh, techniques that are open source and then you can compare against them. Uh, and I think that that's where we're going. Awesome, yeah, thanks for that. Um, Lapai Yu, I wanted to talk about the training XR. Um, so the there's lots of different workshops that happened the two days before the conference and then one day after the conference this year actually. Uh, but. Um, I was going to different ones uh, that were only live or kind of popping around to different ones. I didn't get a chance to try uh, drop into the training one, but that's mm -hmm. one that I think is also uh, that I hope to catch up. The, the YouTube, thankfully, a lot of these were streamed on YouTube, uh, so you can go back and watch a lot of these. So that's this is one of the sessions I want to go back because uh, go back and watch just because I think that the training is an area where you see I see a lot of enterprise applications with say Striver or other companies that are going out and uh, being able to like, bring real value with these immersive technologies. And so, um, and sometimes with the academic conference, there's, sort of, uh, there's always a, a challenge between the types of companies that are now professionalizing the field and doing really high graphics or really cutting edge stuff. And they're not always necessarily sharing all their insights that they're coming, but then there's a lot of research that's still happening that may be using programmer art that's a little like not as immersive as like sort of like professional grade. And so there's always like um, the question that I have in terms of what type of things can you start to really hone in in terms of what are the best practices or in, in training. So be, be really curious to hear from you what type of things you were seeing in terms of either if you start to see more of these companies that are doing professional training, sharing their knowledge back, or if it's also still like from more of the academic research side, what kind of new things that were happening in terms of uh, you know, uh, techniques or insights in terms of how did best practices around training or new insights around uh, training? Yeah, sure. So I, I, I'm really impressed by the insights and creativity of some of the work presented at our workshop. Um, for example, uh, one paper which got the best paper award in our workshop demonstrate how to use uh, virtual reality for Parkinson's disease simulation. So basically in their application, they allow the user to take the role of a person with Parkinson's disease and uh, they perform a simulation to simulate the involuntary uh, shaking of the hand of the Parkinson's disease uh, patient. So that way the users can really feel how it would feel uh, as a person with that disease. And I, I really like this idea because uh, they 
very smartly leverage the virtual embodiment uh, allowed by virtual reality to teach this kind of, uh, uh, I mean, to, for, for this kind of empathy training. Uh, and I would argue it's not easy to do this kind of training with any other media, right? So virtual reality is really a good fit for, for this purpose. Uh, there's another paper that is also very interesting uh, uh, in which they demonstrate creating a like a virtual grocery store to train people with autism to do groceries. So uh, they demonstrate that with this application, uh, the people with uh, autism can feel much more comfortable uh, uh, getting this type of training compared to uh, doing the training in real life. Um, so I, I, I think uh, these ideas are very, very interesting. Uh, the talks are also very interesting. Uh, the first keynote talk is by Kai Johnson from the University of Georgia. So he demonstrates how to use XR training for engineering uh, education. Uh, he, even, he even did a live demo with his students uh, in the talk. I hope this doesn't uh, set too high as a bar for future talks in our workshop, but he did a live demo. So he showed some very cool demos like, uh, like using XR training for survey, uh, uh, for, for survey uh, education. Like if you need to teach students how to do surveying, uh, you can take the student in a virtual space uh, and teach the students in the virtual space like uh, in front of a certain mountain ask the students to follow certain procedure to measure the height, the angle of different things. Um, I think it's really interesting how uh, he created this application uh, based on like multi-user virtual reality uh, and showing how this type of uh, virtual training environment uh, can be very uh, engaging for students. Uh, and it allows like uh, the collaboration of the uh, students and the, and the coach in this uh, common virtual space. I think this is a, a trend and also a very innovative idea. Um, some of the other talks are about like, you know, audio uh, content creation also. So people not just focus on the visual, uh, they also focus on the audio side, like how to generate the audio uh, uh, for the, uh, virtual training application. Uh, and of course, they, they use some more advanced techniques, uh, for example, like deep learning techniques to approximate the sound so that the sound can be simulated in real time uh, rather than, I mean, generated in real time rather than relying on like simulation, which is way too expensive for a like a real virtual training application. Awesome. Yeah, I know that this is a. Uh... A, a rich field and uh, the, the the workshops, uh, the keynote, I really appreciate when the workshops have keynotes because that ends up being uh, really cool to see whoever was invited and coming in. And uh, I would recommend folks kind of popping around to the different uh, sessions and checking out some of the keynotes, but having three keynotes is really great to to go back and check them. Definitely gonna have to go back and check out uh, some of those talks. Um, Definitely, yep. So yeah, and if you go to the overview page, if you go to the uh, IEEEVR.org slash 2021 overview page uh, that you can sort of click through directly to the links to each of those videos, uh, which is you know not intuitively, uh, always, immediately obvious that that's where you would go. But um, yeah, Stefan, uh, Stefania, the, the, you were uh, doing the like sonic interaction, sonification. Uh, I know when I went to IEEEVR in Arles, France in 2015, there was lots of stuff with sonification and biology. There's a whole workshop there on sonification, actually. So sonic interactions, I popped into this session just briefly and just saw some of the different um, talks. Uh, maybe you could talk about some of the highlights that you had from uh, what was new or what was interesting to you when it comes to sonic interactions in VR. Absolutely. So we've been running this workshop for uh, six uh, years, actually. And I think the workshop that you mentioned in ours was also the sonic interaction workshop. But uh, so there is a lot of work, uh, both in the uh, the basic research direction, also what Craig was mentioning on the keynote in his workshop. So lots of work on the deep learning to generate audio also for personalized audio. But what I found very interesting is the new applications that are emerging. So for example, the eating aids industries now, they're using a lot of virtual reality to test their prototypes. 
because uh, in the past, uh, EDNA testing was done mostly uh, just look, considering uh, auditory cues, but right now uh, the companies themselves are uh, much more focused uh, on uh, ecological validity of their any rates. So there's a lot of work on that direction. Also in the empathy side, so how to teach, uh, for example, parents uh, that have uh, children that are any impaired, how to try to make them understand the, the disabilities of their children or also the peers. Also, we were talking uh, about uh, Avatar. Tabitha was saying that there's a lot of work on Avatar. And also we had some interesting uh, uh, papers about the voice of avatars because there is a lot of focus on how an avatar looks, but there's not much on uh, how it sounds. And also, how do you manipulate the voice of the avatar in order to create maybe a better, a more empowerment or a fit the uh, acoustics of the avatar to the acoustics of the room that you are in? So there's lots of interesting uh, combination of uh, basic research with uh, uh, useful applications in different directions. Also walking, we we had uh, some um, applications of actually the sound of walking because also even in the case of redirected walking, there has been a lot of focus on uh, using visual cues. But what about if you also redirect the auditory cues? So if you have a sound source that slowly moves. So all these uh, uh, ways that uh, sound can augment or substitute other modalities. There is still a lot of research that is uh, interesting in that direction. Yeah, when, uh, I just really appreciate the kind of synesthetic ways in which that your brain kind of matches the patterns. And when, I know when I've talked to people who are molecular bi biologists doing protein folding, as an example, uh, adding the sonification just to help them kind of understand a little bit more what was happening. But mm -hmm. is, is that something you're also looking at in your specific research that you're doing? Uh, we are looking at sonifications, yes, for other applications the most. Uh, for example, uh, um, we have, uh, uh, I, in our lab, there is a colleague that is working on uh, uh, sonification for body movement for rehabilitation. So looking at how sound can help a rehabilitation process. Okay, great. And Susan, the, you, during the uh, open AR cloud, the open spatial computing, so during the workshops, there's also tutorials. The tutorials were, uh, there's a number of different tutorials that I went to. I went to the interactive storytelling tutorial and uh, there's some other ones, but what were some of the things that you were trying to cover in the tutorial that you're doing here at IEEE VR this year? Uh, you might be muted. Thank you. I can't see it on the screen, the mute button, because um, I'm on my phone. Um, so yeah, we mostly we wanted to get some exposure and teach people what we're doing. Uh, the Open Air Cloud is about we promote and our mission is to have spatial computing be interoperable and accessible for everyone. And so uh, we want to avoid walled gardens of like, you know, Microsoft, uh, Niantic, Mag uh, Magic Leap and provide a way for all these different technologies to work together interoperably. So that's that's our main mission, and we're a nonprofit organization and completely volunteer. So in December or November, the end of last year, we had our first implementation of our reference APIs where we were able to uh, prove out uh, reference API for GeoPose and our spatial services discovery and our content, spatial content discovery services that allow different services to talk together. So our goal was to uh, let people know about what we were, who we are, and what our tools could provide, and actually put them out into the wild and see what people could build. And so it, that's why we had the week in between with the asynchronous support and uh, you know, it was really exciting to have people come in and learn about the technology, understand the complexity of interoperability with technology that's um, itself complex. And so it also, like I said before, catalyzed us internally. It got our team working and testing out the technology for ourselves and and building the de documentation and being able to support the participants. So um, 
it was really a great opportunity to to move it forward, put it out into the world, put it out into people's hands. And um, one of our supporters was Ori Imbar from um, Augmented World Expo, and he provided tickets free passes for AWE for the participants that submitted projects. And so that was a really good incentive for them because our technology right now, because it's so early, is not for the faint of heart. You know, we don't have a packaged product. Um, and so it was really great to see people committed to the mission and being willing to, you know, um, kind of work with, with something that's still in progress. And, and experiment along with us. Very cool. And were there things that people were producing then, or maybe you could give an example of something that someone made? Um, okay, so there were two projects and uh, one was in Glasgow um, along a river. I'm not sure which river it is. He wanted to do a historical experience where people could come and get a shared AR experience about the history of the location. And so he had a ship, a 3D model of a ship that he placed along the river with um, the intention of being able to interact with it um, through voice and through just uh, additional information in the terms of like text where people could learn about the history of the location. And so um, he will, continue on working in his project. Um, what the participants um, had some trouble with scanning, especially on the water, where the water doesn't allow enough unique points to, you can't really use water in, in spatial. So it worked when it was, you know, the camera was up from the water and just along the riverside, but there was a lot of te technical issues with the water itself. Um, and so uh, he'll continue to work with our team to improve his application. And then the other gentleman, um, it was, he lived in London and it was, it was also location and kind of historical base, but in regards to, um, he had totem pole like objects that he wants to put in different places. And he wants to, uh, build an experience around the spirit of a location and to have it be uh, also a way that people could add content and not just be one way, but to build the spirit of a location. Um, and so that's really interesting. And he also will be continuing on uh, working with our team to develop that into a real application that he's going to put out into the world. Um, and then internally, we also have projects that we're uh, building. We have a, a test bed that's live in Bari, Italy already, uh, one in Helsinki. And I know uh, a couple of our partners are also building out experiences. Uh, we have a partner in Turkey building out an experience at um, the library in Istanbul, I mean, the airport in Istanbul. Uh, we have another one of our partners uh, doing work in San Francisco and Seattle, and I myself am doing something in Los Angeles downtown at Pershing Square. So it's awesome. exciting to have uh, have these spaces getting mapped and um, being made accessible to the public. It's it's the very beginnings, and it's we're we're thrilled. Uh, we're thrilled with the two participants that we had that are actually engaged in building and um, Ori is going to have us at augmented world reality uh, also to, to take it even further. Okay. Great. Is it, was a video online for people to go watch that, to check it out and get more information. Do you know? Uh, which, which part? The, the, tutorial, the tutorial that was at IEEE. Uh, the tutorials that have not been made public, but we, we plan to make them public. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I wanted to move on to kind of the conference buzz part where, you know, there's a, a small window for me. I know that if I don't watch stuff over the next couple of days, I'm probably not going to watch it. Like I, there's a part where the river kind of keeps flowing. Um, and that 
these lots of different virtual conferences that come and go. I, I'm sure some people maybe feel the same way in terms of when they attend a conference, they either they see what they see and then it's it becomes exponentially more difficult to see something the longer it goes out. So I wanted to get a little bit of each of your highlights, both from either if it was a session, a, a conference paper, a journal paper, one of the 3D UI demos or one of the, the demos or the videos or one of the poster sessions, you know, there's like over a hundred different poster sessions across two expo halls and for Bella uh, or any other things that, you know, a keynote or a talk or whatever it might be, some of your personal highlights that you found either particularly interesting or striking or something that uh, you're kind of taking away from this IEEE VR 2021. I'll start and then someone can jump in. Uh, I have a Twitter thread where I have an ongoing thing, but one of the things that was interesting for me was Ed Swan had a workshop where he was doing a lot of replication studies. Really that like, was going to be one of mine. Oh, you well, maybe you, should, maybe you should talk about it. Talk about that. No, that, go. I, I'll add on. <laughs> well, so there is a whole thing about just the replication crisis, and there's a whole tutorial around it was really a dense sort of statistics primer, but uh, I think the project that, and there's a poster session that also is uh, associated with that, where they were going in and trying to replicate like five years worth of human computer interaction research that was uh, uh, published in ISMAR and IEEE VR, uh, trying to see if they could replicate it or not. Um, and just to see if it was like, because anything, anytime you involve humans, then it's like, you know, you want to make sure that it's not just those subset of humans or these insights about human computer interaction that are generalizable to some extent. And so if you only have one study and there's a bias towards talking about new stuff, here I am asking about what's new <laughs> when it's like, you know, hey, there was a replication of something that uh, proved out that there was different. That's just not something that either the press or the media or academics or there's like a bias against new stuff. So I think Ed was sort of like, hey, let's like look at this statistically and really do a deep dive. And, and almost like get, adding this extra level of rigor to this human computer interaction. So I thought that was interesting to see just as a, a, a trend, I hadn't seen that before. And it seems like a new thing that I know Ed is involved in helping to curate different uh, uh, aspects of the what is selected and in the papers and journals. And so he's a, a part of all that, but this is maybe at the beginning of a, a movement of trying to do this kind of replication. So Tabitha, I don't know if you had any other things you wanted to add into that. Uh, participating in that tutorial. In yeah, that well, so, um, so Ed has been doing this tutorial, um, I think since 2018, he's done it at IEEE VR, he's done this at ISMAR, um, and it's really presenting work from kind of the replication crisis from the psychology literature that basically they found that a lot of studies didn't really replicate and so really kind of pushing, um, pushing our community to reconsider how we're looking at research and really focusing on the importance of not just doing the work once, but maybe doing it multiple times and uh, respecting and appreciating research that is replicating someone else's work to see if it does the same thing or if it doesn't. And knowing that you know, as, as reviewers and as a community, we should appreciate that work and say, oh, this did replicate, great, that's a really good sign, or this didn't replicate, maybe we need to reconsider this, um, what we have considered fact for so long and run it again and see if it's really true or not. Um, and then this kind of gets even more important when we're talking about some of the studies we're talking about were done in the 90s or early 2000s. And so you're talking about very different hardware very different latencies, very different computing power. Talk about field of view changes if you're talking about perceptual studies. Um, there are a lot of things that are changing. And so kind of revisiting this um, previous work is really important. I have more things to add on to that, but I know Mara, I can see that you wanna to add to this. Yeah, story. yes. I, yes, I mean, this is was something that in, in our workshop came out quite a lot, right? Like there are these studies from NASA on motion sickness that are like super old, They're from um, the 70s. but they are like a hundred pages, right? Like super deep. Uh, and with that in hand, reviewers kill whatever thing you wanna publish on motion sickness. 
uh, forever and ever. Uh, latency of uh, systems is also something that is very hard to publish on latency. Let's say reviewers look you at the millisecond, right? <laughs> Uh, but uh, I mean, there are all these areas that, as you say, technology has evolved. And I think one of the solutions we were having there is having benchmarks, right? Um, in which, uh, which is happening in many other fields, like computer vision mostly is about, hey, how well do you perform on this database of uh, images or, um, and then it's, it's not even, you don't need to replicate other things. It's more like if you perform a bit better, it's already an improvement. Um, and generally they also replicate, right? Like they say, oh, this is how well uh, this other thing performs on this and this is how well I perform on this. So it also helps on the evaluation. But um, yeah, I agree uh, that there are so many things that have changed from the 90s to now um, that uh, it, it doesn't make it invalid. For example, we've been looking at all uh, of how uh, video conferencing has evolved in just one year. Like a few years ago, people were uncomfortable uh, turning on cameras. And it's not like that research was wrong. It was right. People didn't like cameras. Uh, when there was, uh, you know, MSN Messenger, there was a feature to put cameras and nobody would use it. Uh, and now it's uh, normal, right? Um, and things evolve or like wearing headphones in the street. People thought like, no way, you would never do that. Uh, and just like, you don't care that you're talking on the phone or all these things are uh, changing, especially for things like human computer interaction that have a very important behavioral aspect to them. Um, so I agree with that. I mean, the replication crisis is partially stopping research from happening because you're disagreeing with previous things that maybe they were not wrong, but they are not right now. It's, yeah, it's the important I, thing to reevaluate. I wanna add one other piece to this because it's something that I think is really important. And that's in the diversity of the participants that you are using to run these studies. Um, so a year ago, I published a paper at VR looking at the demographics of participants that were um, that have been used in um, in research studies over five years, and what we found was that women were significantly underrepresented compared to men, and that a lot of other demographics are just not reported. So we have we don't actually know the demographics that we're looking at, um, but then beyond that, we found that. Um, the proportion of women in a study significantly impacted the simulator sickness results that were reported in the study in, an, in a way that you wouldn't expect that um, the more women you had, the lower the simulator sickness scores. Um, and this was through a, a meta-analysis of the papers um, that were looked at for five years. So um, not only replication is being important, but also considering the participant samples that we're using um, in investigating these results because that's affecting how we're designing um, the, the hardware, how we're designing the software, how we're designing anything that we're creating. Yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing all that additional context. And uh, I wanna make a, a quick note, uh, follow on just in, uh, on that Friday before I Triple VR, I did an interview with uh, Facebook Reality Labs, uh, D Director of Neuromotor Interfaces, Thomas Reardon. And, Control Labs, they, the whole reason how they got started was that they were overriding scientific dogma for 50 years that said that you couldn't sort of isolate down to an individual motor neuron. And they were like, well, we're going to figure it out with machine learning and all these uh, surface level uh, electromyography. And they basically were able to kind of make these breakthrough revolutions in the sense of that there was a way of kind of going against some of what this, whatever the scientific dogma was at the time. So I think there's a uh, value for you know the knowledge that is true for maybe a certain amount of period given the certain technology but it's worth kind of continually re revisiting all this stuff um and just a one other uh mention for uh facebook reality labs there was a, a paper from facebook reality labs looking at how you could extrapolate eye gaze from looking at just the hand and the uh head pose uh and uh, they also had uh, information about the uh, environmental context and a baseline of um, eye tracking data to be able to, as a baseline to compare, well, that they could sort of extrapolate 
uh, your eye gaze based upon what you were doing with your hands and your uh, head, uh, knowing what you were doing in the environment. And it turns out they could, and that, that was a poster that was there, which I thought was kind of interesting just in terms of the, these big companies that are, have uh, interns that uh, are coming and publishing different papers. There's Nokia Labs uh, and some other, um, uh, I don't know if they're in Amazon was in, in keynote uh, having some of the stuff that they were showing. So for me, uh, kind of seeing how the industry is also uh, getting involved in different ways. Uh, but yeah, I didn't know if uh, Stephania or Craig or uh, Susan, if you had other highlights from the conference uh, of things that kind of stuck out for you. Uh, I actually enjoyed this morning the uh, Everyday Virtual Reality Workshop. That's also one that has been running for some years. And it's, uh, I mean, it just simply was uh, demonstrating how virtual reality now is becoming really part of many aspects of everyday life. So there was some uh, papers about the virtual reality exercises, some about uh, how to use virtual reality for exposure therapy for alcoholic people. So it was uh, a lot of different uh, applications. And uh, that was organized by Adalberto Simeone, and he has been doing it uh, for quite some years. And also you already mentioned the Frank uh, keynote, Frank Steinick keynote. That was also a very nice comprehensive uh, overview of uh, the history and also the combination between perception, action and cognition and what uh, can we do with virtual and mixed reality. That was very nice as well. Yeah, definitely one of my highlights. Yeah, one of the other things that I, I really like, I was chairing this session on presence, but I finally couldn't uh, join the chair, but I watched it uh, later also. And and there was this work by Mel Slater, uh, who Tabitha and I know very well, um, uh, because he was my PhD advisor also. Uh, but um, this point in which we're starting to have things that are more on the wild, Right, like he reproduced a complete uh, concert of dire straits and put people there uh, with a lot of avatars, with a lot of, um, you know, it feels like uh, it feels very ambitious, but I also feel like uh, we have tools now that could allow any of us to build this type of experience. And I think people haven't realized yet that. You know, there are new open sourcing tools, uh, you know, the libraries of, of avatars, animation libraries. I have been very involved on this open sourcing myself uh, with the Microsoft Rocketbox, but uh, there are many other things happening, right? Like the meta humans, or I feel like we need to embrace these things more uh, and try to have very ambitious uh, projects in that sense, because this is what's going to happen on, on, on Steam VR and Oculus Store and, you know, this uh, type of um, a much larger scale. And we should start using that as our test bed. Um, I think a lot of people love that talk also. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm definitely looking forward to diving into more of those uh, embodiment and presence sessions, uh, just because I think it's a very fascinating intersection of um, the uh, perception, neuroscience, and all that. Uh, I think one of the uh, the award winners for the best uh, PhD dissertation was a lot about reality and experience that looked like it was also digging into what uh, she's now a, uh, uh, a assistant professor, I think USCB or something uh, uh, somewhere in California. But um, she was looking at how there was uh, uh, also additional models of, of perception. And um, yeah, I think the, the neuroscience perception and embodiment, I think those are all like really fascinating areas that I, I think is really interesting intersections that I hope to, I, I look forward to digging into more of those sessions as well. But um, yeah, what else other other uh, highlights from the, the conference? Related to that, I'm going to, I'm going to put in a plug for the, um, the, pa the panel on using avatars to mitigate bias. So that's very much related to the cognition and perception of the avatars. Um, so we, we were um, panelists that, so I presented some of my own work, but we also had um, sociologists and psychologists that had been studying and researching bias and using virtual reality to both create experiences that address bias, to um, create, to promote conversation and self-awareness um, we had somebody from industry who's specifically developing VR applications for um, implicit bias training in, um, in jobs. 
And then um, some of my own work looking at how self avatars can affect you and potentially um, reduce uh, racial bias or look at uh, mitigating stereotype threat. Yeah, to be honest, because our workshop went throughout the whole week, um, there wasn't a lot of time to see other content, but I am um, very interested in the work that Dr. Marr is, is doing in locomotion, and it's uh, somewhat similar to uh, another research project that I'm working on, Virtual Experience Interaction Lab, where we're uh, doing heuristic analysis of a wide range of VR experiences, and specifically, our main goal is to look at interaction patterns in VR, catalog and compare interaction patterns, but we are collecting other data, um, such as presence and embodiment, and we're looking um, a little bit into what we call inclusivity, um, but like how customizable our avatars and um, do, do, do they encompass uh, completely the way people want to be represented? And so those are some of the, the um, data points that we're collecting and, and looking at. Yeah, I would very much like to to see what you find out there. I mean, uh, actually, David and I were both very interested on this whole idea of having some standard about embodiment. And we pushed forward a questionnaire a couple of years ago that I, I would mm -hmm. say is currently the, the main used one. And this year, we have revived it uh, with a validation that I think is very thorough. Uh, with over nine experiments ranging from haptics to right, like everywhere where you could use a, an avatar, also some of them with locomotion. Um, and then we, each one of these participants, which rank about 400 questionnaires totally answered. Um, then we, we have explored whether the questions really work, right? Which questions work? Uh, we try to make it also more universal because some questions, I mean, there are some experiments in which you don't touch the participants. So why are we talking about this? Um, so we have reduced it and we just, I think it just came out um, two months ago, uh, the new mm -hmm. version. So I think there is uh, a lot of interest on having, uh, as we say, benchmarks or uh, standardized things. Um, and regarding the, the how participants have a ability to, to change their avatars, I think in general, we're still uh, facing a problem with authoring tools. Super limited. Mm -hmm. We have two authoring tools. Uh, and even with that, I mean, I'm still amazed because we used to build everything that we have the asset store, right? That we can buy some things or share things, but it still is, is very limited, the asset store, right? Uh, and the, the authoring tools. And I think we need to move that to the next level and, and contribute. If we have a problem, other people are having the same problem. So, I mean, at least that's the approach I'm taking on the avatars and providing, you know, these animation toolkits. And we're preparing now one for facial animation too, um, that will come out soon. But, you know, this, I, I think these are the right problems, the right questions. People wanna have more customization and more authoring. And it, it cannot be that you need a computer science degree for this, you know, people who do psychology should be able to do this quite easy, right? Like they don't, you don't need a computer science degree to open a PowerPoint and do a presentation. So, you know, I feel like that that's the big challenge to reach a authoring on the consumer level also. Yeah, I, I agree with Ma um, on the authoring tools. Uh, in fact, I believe for VR training or XR training in general, we also need uh, authoring tools that target the general users uh, because as you said like most of the people who uh, want to apply the VR training or XR training may not be expert in VR XR so we need to have tools that are very intuitive uh, 
to let general users to create uh, training content. Kind of like we need WordPress, right? When we have WordPress for creating websites, so why don't we have uh, very intuitive offering tools that allow people to build uh, any training content, uh, even if without any coding. Uh, so right now in the VR training community, um, people have to spend a lot of time to build the content uh, specifically for a third, uh, specific uh, training application. And I believe like if you have a more general purpose offering tools that would uh, escalate the, the scale of VR training that could be applied uh, in many different domains. Yeah, one last. Uh... Uh, Mar, Dr. Mar, I just wanted to let you know that we're actually using your embodiment questionnaire. Mm -hmm. So that will be to um, make the correlation between interaction pat patterns and, and embodiment. Um, so awesome. thank you for your work. Yeah, <laughs> I hope it's, it's good. And uh, I mean, we're open for feedback, right? Uh, and recently mm -hmm. we see other questionnaires coming and like I, be, I I'm asked to review questionnaires. I'm like, it's good. I mean, we will converge. It, I think there is a bit this, we don't want many questionnaires because we don't want them to be a standard. Uh, but then uh, recently, for example, we got one that is supposed to be super short. So it has three questions. Of course, that cannot compete with a thorough investigation of embodiment. But in some cases, maybe if you are doing this on longitudinal, I mean, there might be cases where that applies, right? So I, I, I am not trying to push uh, our uh, uh, questions, which are actually start with a, a review of which questions have been used by the community. I mean, it's not even that we mm -hmm. are inventing the wheel. We just want to have a more standard um, and yeah, increased um, sensitivity, sensi sensitivity of what can we measure, right? How much? So, yeah. And what's great about the way you, you've structured it is that it allows you to remove sections that aren't relevant to your particular study. And that flexibility um, has been very helpful for us. And then, that's but you still, get, uh, you still get a meaningful score. Yeah, that's precisely what we had in mind. So I'm happy that you're using yeah. it. <laughs> and if you have feedback, just we're, we're always open on, on this. Sure, absolutely. Great. So uh, probably do another uh, 10, 15 minutes and open up for uh, questions for the last 15 minutes. So if you do have questions, go ahead and add them into the question and answer box there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a couple of my other highlights that I saw uh, were uh, in a, I think it was Ann Basic, is that her name? She did a keynote for the um, novel input devices and sort of different ways that you can kind of have different devices for input. I think input over uh, the next, you know, five to 10 years is going to continue to be increasing. And uh, as we start to see uh, Facebook rally labs with neural input devices, you know, looking at that as a, as a, just a, a trend in general. And um, yeah, also I, I sort of went through a uh, kind of a running log of some of the highlights I have. I'm going to post to my Twitter and the, in the chat thread, a Twitter thread, just to kind of, if folks want to uh, track down some of the other uh, pointers or highlights that I had. But um, one of the things that I, I noticed is that the poster sessions often will maybe, uh, they're not uh, mature enough to be, uh, let's say papers, or maybe there's not enough data, or maybe it's just like very early research that hasn't necessarily been fully formed yet uh, to have like conceptual frameworks or really have something to say for, for whatever reason that the, it's a poster and not a paper. And so, but I see the, the poster sessions as a way to kind of like see, okay, what's coming next uh, as a future research directions that are just kind of getting started. So curious if there's anything that anyone saw that was striking from that perspective of like, okay, here's some whole other, you know, research directions where things could start to go. Or if there's if there were any one one thing that I saw at least what that was interesting was uh, Yuto uh, Ito Yuta Ito who who was saying that the, showing how uh, this kind of new augmented reality device where rather than inside out it's sort of like this projected area thing that's sort of doing some sort of weird I, I don't actually fully understand what exactly they're doing there's some sort of weird mashing up of projection mapping external like it was projecting things in but they had a headset on. It was sort of like an exotic uh, 
new way of delivering augmented reality experiences that uh, we're trying to get past some of the limitations of what you could do on a um, like a mobile device, but have the power of a uh, like pro external projector. And so these kind of like that was something that was new and exotic that I hadn't seen before. And like I said, the in input devices in the workshop was something that was interesting to see how that continues to develop. But uh, if just curious to hear if there's anything else like that, or if there's other things that are kind of leading you into whatever you're personally working on and researching. Yeah, I think devices in general is this area where you can go very exploratory. For example, we have a lot of haptic devices that we've been building over the last years. Uh, and we base them on controllers. So they are not that exotic, really, because the idea that a controller will have haptics is not that. Uh, but I feel like uh, it's always interesting to see these divergent uh, trends. Uh, it's very hard to do research on devices. It's much more expensive. You need a lab. Uh, I think software uh, beats there in terms of uh, resources. Um, and then the other thing with devices is that it's like a software thing. If it works, I can make a game and by next year it's out. Uh, with the devices that uh, will not happen because uh, you need to produce them. You need to, the, there are many things that uh, make it so complex. And that's why for me personally, when uh, HoloLens was first released, it was the first time you could have a transparent screen of this size mass produced, right? That was the big thing um, in terms of, um, fabrication. And I feel like many of these uh, tools uh, are interesting and, and they sometimes explore something. Hey, right now, imagine we don't have any more the problem of having to wear anything, right? Or like, I think that that sort of like leap forward, considering this is solved and now let's solve the next problem. I think that that makes sense also. Um, but yeah, on the devices, what I see is that many times it will never see the light of day, uh, but it's fine also. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like when I see these things, they are always very surprising. But at the same time, um, you know, we're, we're only going to see them in, in this type of fairs. Yeah, any personal uh, either paper uh, poster highlights from anybody else? Um, I've got a, I've got two. Um, so one is a paper I was by Williams et al. Um, it's on uh, redirected walking. So it's kind of this whole, how do you actually turn the virtual world imperceptibly and steer and guide people along the way? And um, one of the big questions in this is how do you, which direction do you turn the world and how do you actually do that? And um, he, he proposed this, it's a really simple idea, which is always some of the best because you're like, oh, of course that's gonna work. Um, where he would uh, basically rotate the virtual world so that the stationary objects in the world, so say a wall or a table would line up with the stationary objects in the real world. So if you need to avoid the table, you would line up the virtual table with say a wall that you're walking next to. And um, what he found was that this was really better than a lot of the techniques out there. Um, so I thought that was a really, a really clever idea for a problem that we've been looking for. Uh, we've been looking for a solution for, for a really long time. Um, so I thought that was really exciting. Um, and then, uh, in my own work, one of the things that we did was we, we were looking at new measures. So everybody keeps talking about how we need better measures and how do we actually measure everything. Um, and so we looked at taking tracking data. So taking your hand, um, your hand movement and your head movement, um, specifically in looking at shooter bias. So people sh making shooting decisions against black avatars or white avatars. And we found, um, significant correlations in people's accuracy against um, either white avatars or black avatars um, connected to how they moved their hands and their heads during those trials. 
And so um, we're proposing that as a new, um, a new implicit measure for how to look at bias or behavior change in these environments. Oh, wow. Fascinating. Uh, Craig, it looks like you, you have to leave here in a few minutes, but I wanted to give you an opportunity if you want to give any final thoughts or uh, takeaways from the conference or where, what you're excited to go next in your own research uh, and XR. Yeah, so uh, we see that the training XR uh, topic is very popular and we will definitely continue the workshop next year. So if you have any good ideas, good insights about Excel training, please submit to our workshop. Uh, we also have a, uh, turn a special issue in the Frontiers in Virtual Reality Journal on Excel training, uh, because this community is really growing. So if you have any uh, academic work that you want to uh, publish related to Excel training, uh, consider our, our journal chapter. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, thanks for coming by. And if you have to drop off, feel free to, to leave whenever you, you need to. Um, one other things that I would say that a trend that I saw was just issues of ethics and privacy, I think kind of throughout the conference sort of bubbling up uh, here and there, there was a, a privacy workshop before and then an ethics workshop after. Um, and then I popped in at the end of them just because it was like super early here in Pacific Coast time. But um, even in the keynotes uh, with say Stephen Feiner, um, you know, Stephen Feiner's keynote, he, he gave a keynote 18 years ago in 2003. And then his keynote this year was kind of like, oh, let me go back and see what I saw said 18 years ago and see what, what has changed and what hasn't. And one of the things that hadn't really changed much is the privacy implications. And, you know, his concerns back then are still, you know, pretty relevant today. And we've certainly had a lot of cultural evolution in terms of what is acceptable when it comes to technology. But yet at the same time, uh, I think still a lot of these larger issues of ethics and privacy are are pretty huge. It's a big reason why I'm helping to, you know, uh, coordinate this IEEE global initiative on the ethics of extended reality uh, and try to bring together different uh, folks from industry and academia to try to produce a, a research paper uh, or a white paper um, to kind of like do an accounting of that. But there seems to be at least some, some. it's an issue that I think if you start talking about any of these technologies for long enough, it inevitably comes up the ethical implications. And so yeah, I don't know if anybody had any offhand thought about some of those ethics and privacy dimensions uh, that were also coming up. Uh, if not, then we can uh, start to move yeah, to I'm, the other I'm questions. I'm happy <laughs> to talk about it a little bit, right? I think um, uh, with every technology, there are ways you can do the good and the bad. And uh, there are two things here, right? Um, one, we should all try to put ourselves in what can happen. Uh, but I also feel like um, uh, it should not prevent us from continuing the research and continuing uh, making progress. Um, yeah. So it is a, a difficult area to talk about. Uh, I think governments are also very concerned much more than before about these things. And they are laying down uh, regulations for these things, right? Um, but I, I do think that it's good to have a group sessions in which these things are discussed explicitly just for this. Uh, because an ethicist will see things that I will not see. And I think we're seeing that across many other areas. Uh, for example, AI is super big right now. I think pretending that people who are doing neural networks and maths to be also ethicists, it's something that is maybe beyond what they should do. And that's why I think this um, multidisciplinary teams are most successful, right? because I don't need to be an ethicist if there is an ethicist who will evaluate how my work will uh, impact. Uh, and of course I should be aware of it, uh, but I think uh, there is a bit of a, a complex situation right now with technologies in general. I don't think for VR, this is particularly strong. I think other technologies are facing much bigger challenges 
uh, but uh, yeah, we're seeing this and I think it's important that the, uh, we answer the questions, right? Uh, because if not, the consumers will not trust a particular technology. So I do agree that we need it, but also we have to see how it works, right? Yeah, for sure. Well, maybe that's a, a, a good time to uh, move over to, oh, Susan, if you want to say something, hey, you're muted. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah I, I, I'm, still, I'm muted? No, no we, you, can hear you. we can hear you. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, that's kind of next on our roadmap with uh, Open Air Cloud is that we are uh, working on compliance records and collaboration with some of our ac academic partners and um, our participation with the OGC test bed 17. And that that's uh, very much uh, what we're here to do in addition to the interoperability. So I know that that's something that's being talked about and thought about a lot and anyone is free to join in the conversation and uh, become a member or just contribute through our Discord channel. Awesome, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, maybe yeah. let's uh, like move over to the questions. So we have some time to dig into some of the audience questions. And so this one's from James Adams. What are your favorite VR hardware add-ons and sensors for tracking parts of the body outside of hands? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I Anybody think here, using this is something technology? that we're seeing that um, is kind of going to converge in a way with other technologies like AI, right? Like um, you can know your heart rate by your tiny movements on your head. So if you have, if you're wearing cameras and I can track how you're, uh, this is moving on an aesthetic uh, view. And we show that on cardio lens also. We embedded that on the, on the hollow lens and we call it cardio lens. So you can know your heart rate just with this, right? A camera that is connected to your body. So of course we can know that if you're moving your hands like this, you probably should be moving your legs like this. So I do think that they, we're going to see a lot of more uh, congruent animations with less sensors in our avatars. So you're not gonna have to wear a full bodysuit. You will wear it if you want exact accurate metrics of what your movement is. For example, if you are uh, some of the users of the rocket box that are in Montreal studying gait after a stroke, of course, they have a whole setup to do motion tracking of every single joint, right? Uh, but if not, I mean, you don't need any of that. You just need something that looks natural and that you can control and that it's um, more or less accurate with what you want. And then when we get there, uh, we can add layers. Uh, we'll have a paper coming out this year on this uh, technique, but uh, you know, we can add layers of how the movement, the stylization of the movement, right? The, um, whether you look sad or happy or you're far better than you actually are. Like I'm playing a game where I'm a basketball player and I'm very bad at basketball. So it can, because it's based on data, right? Like we retrieve what the, the data more or less says. Um, I think all of this is coming. And so the idea that with limited uh, sensors, you can have a much higher quality of movement prediction. I think this will be there. As a, as a practitioner and someone who's really thinking about uh, spatial computing and how will we interact with the real world when we're just wearing glasses, and I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of glasses than, than the phone, um, some very, in a practical way, where I don't maybe have access to uh, the advanced technology that you're talking about, Mar Dr. Mara, of course, um, I see that as where we're going, but like for right now as a practitioner, 
how can I create interaction uh, in a spatial, in, you know, working spatially. And I've found this, I'm going to put the link in the chat room, um, a little mouse driven device on your finger that has um, touch control and dial, right? So it, it, it gives you the same kinds of interactions that you would have with the mouse, but now you can now you can program that to interact spatially in, in the real world. So from a more uh, practical standpoint of like, what can I use right now in building my experiences? Um, I'm looking to solutions similar to this. And it is not uh, a commercial interface and uh, it is outside the hand and it's something we built like a uh, more than 10 years ago, as part of an European project, is a pair of shoes which have sensors and also actuators. And these actuators are really high fidelity. So when you walk in the surface of your lab, you can feel the simulated surfaces, like if you're walking on grass and gravel and so on. And we made the several perceptual studies that show that actually people can recognize the surfaces only by having haptic sensation at the feet, even without uh, uh, hearing or seeing them. So this is uh, something that uh, is related to interfaces, not for the hands. And it's also connected to a follow-up question that there is by Rolf Knus. He's asking about pros and cons of having the workshop virtually. I think one of the biggest cons is uh, the lack of trying all these uh, uh, silly or uh, these strange interfaces that uh, you cannot really experience in Zoom. So yeah, these you... new input devices and all these uh, uh, these hardware input devices, uh, they can be experienced only in person. So beside the obvious disadvantages of uh, not having uh, uh, better interactions and uh, so on, I think that is the biggest disadvantage of having the conference online. Yeah, there were some actual remote demos that were this year where the uh, University of Georgia, Kyle Johnson, and, and one of his students named Andrew, you could uh, download a Unity application. Actually, they had a WebGL version of it so that you could start to operate a robot, a $60,000 robot remotely and move it around. And then I was in a Discord channel watching the live video and being able to kind of like uh, see the uh, impact of me operating and trying to pick up this block. It was very really quite hard because it was no depth cues and it was all 2D interfaces, three camera views, but still I'm trying to like move this uh, camera or this robot without any sort of virtual objects in there. So there there were some demos mm -hmm. that you could do. And then there was someone else, the the Magnopia, I think they, they won one of the honor, honorable mentions, but uh, they had a live demo where I was sort of, you know, just watching a, a YouTube live stream of him. And they had this mixed reality where uh, someone was standing there in a room and then uh, and he was being a virtual agent teleporting in and then uh, doing these different interactions. But you are right that once you get into the exotic input and other demos, you can't really do them over yeah, we, through VR. Exactly. We had also some nice demos in that space VR on virtual reality musical instruments. But also there, I mean, you were missing like the control and the, the feeling of playing the instrument, like with a keyboard or with any interface. So just by pressing button, it becomes very unnatural. But it's true, I mean, it's better than nothing, of course, but still you're missing the tactile feedback that you get in the real world. Yeah, and the 3D UI demos are usually pretty interesting as well, because yeah. those are things that you can also like kind of try out. And hopefully in the future, we'll find better ways of distributing binaries to people that they could try at home or if there's a high it's in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand, which has not had any issues with the COVID. So it's pretty likely that it will actually have a face-to-face uh, -face gathering next year. But at the same time, uh, I, I'm hoping that they'll continue to do certain things in a hybrid fashion. Mm -hmm. I think uh, just discussing with people, the, uh, the virtual, uh, the poster session is probably a good candidate for that in terms of, you know, if people want to come in and see some of those poster sessions and uh, see stuff. But yeah, I'm curious to hear other thoughts of people at that question of what were some of the pros and cons of having the workshop virtually versus being there in present? Yeah, I think uh, it was uh, great in terms of accessibility uh, for many people who cannot travel. 
economies, families, there are many reasons why uh, this was great. And actually I, I'm part of BGTC, uh, which is the technical committee that organizes uh, IEEE VR, ISMAR, uh, the VIS conference um, on the ethics and diversity. And I'm working very much with the person who is in charge of the conference organization, because from uh, diversity, we also think on a geographic uh, perspective, right? A person from India cannot pay uh, a trip or from Latin America to the US or Europe or Australia every other day. Um, so I think we're gonna try to aim to have a, a, a system in which some people can still be virtual moving forward, right? Like some good things to the stay. Uh, of course, for them, as like Stefania was saying, especially th things with devices, it's very hard to, to demo. Um, and um, so I, they're, yeah, pros and cons. Yeah, yeah, and I think the uh, the use of Discord this year, I think, was uh, really nice to see how that was really in integrated. And now that there's like a Discord community that uh, people who attended the conference, I'm hoping, well, maybe we'll have some continued conversations or ways to kind of connect with the, the community. So that, yeah, that was nice to see. I love Discord, and I thought it was, I like how easy it is to go multiple tracks, especially as conferences are growing. Uh, I... I more and more like the single track 70 people conference uh, still, right? But it's very hard if you go to Kai, you, you cannot even see half of what's going on. And here you just jump from one place to another, right? So that's super nice. Uh, however, for example, in China, Discord is, is restricted. You cannot access. Uh, so there are places that it's... Um, there will always be something that I think it was well tackled by putting a stream on YouTube and Twitch. So you guarantee that if you're restricted in some way, you'll have access in another way. And also it gave this platform for even people who hadn't registered to watch it, right? Which I think it's kind of great that we have created all these tiers of for students, uh, especially if we're gonna create a community that grows which is also a discussion. Some people don't want it to grow, right? Like look at Seagraph, it's a monster right now. Um, and then when you have something uh, like this, you need the students also to be interested, involved in, and they cannot travel, right, many times. So I kind of um, like many things about the accessibility of it in terms of uh, economics. Uh, and also on real accessibility, right? Like if, if you have any sort of um, disability traveling, it's a very complex thing. And being at home where you have your whole setup and logging in to see some or, or hear some talks is so much easier. Yeah, well, we should probably, we got just like five minutes to kind of wrap things up here. And I just curious to hear if anyone has any kind of takeaways in terms of what's next uh, for either you personally or things that you're, you're taking away from this gathering. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, the uh, Roger and um, the Holonautic team to uh, partner with Open Air Cloud and start bringing hand tracking to augmented reality. That's why I'd love to see that as a next iteration for them and for us. What are the possibilities of that for us? <laughs> they, they have to leave uh, because they are still dealing with the launch uh, and fixes. So I will definitely let them know about that. That's a, actually a great idea. I, I think like, especially from a, a mixed reality point of view, already hand interactions and hand tracking is a must. And uh, definitely this is something um, I, will, I will share with them. Great. Great. And uh, final thoughts from Tabitha, Stefina, or Dr. Mar? Yeah, I'll just wrap up from my side. I think uh, uh, I love going to these conferences and, and uh, when you 
I find networking to be easier in virtual than in, in real uh, because I don't like dinners and these type of things. But uh, and um, but I feel like we're creating communities much easier, like uh, follow ups. It's so much easier to schedule a follow up in, uh, you know, I'll, I'll send you this or uh, the, the the distance between meeting someone and an email is so much shorter now and I I kind of love that and I feel like we had a lot of good conversations on how to move forward uh, my main agenda now is on authoring tools and that includes open sourcing tools for um, avatars uh, creating the standards and like big databases of uh, things for VR like the locomotion world um, and I feel like um, all these tools, you need to engage with people who are using them to learn. Like, I mean, Ferran was just saying, right? Like with the hands physics lab, uh, people are like giving feedback and fixing things. And so I think all these uh, tools and we're seeing a lot of new tools coming out uh, is, is what we're gonna see um, now. And the good thing is that every one of us can contribute, right? Like. Um, open sourcing their own uh, tools. Um, so I feel like uh, an open sourcing can have different tiers, right? Like it doesn't need to be completely open source. It can be an asset in the store or something like that. But I feel like uh, that's something that I've seen a lot of enthusiasm in this conference this year. And I hope I, I can also contribute there moving forward. Um, uh, I'll jump in next. So um, one of the things that I'd say that I, I missed about it being in person, um, so I completely agree with the economic advantages and how it made it so it was accessible for so many people. And I do think the conference will continue to support that, which I'm happy about. But there's something about the people in this community that are just really special and being able to sit down and have those dinners. I know you might not want to, Mar, but um, like getting to sitting down and just talking to someone or grabbing a drink with someone or coffee um, is just something that it, it's not quite the same um, when you're remote. And so um, I think that they did a nice job with kind of the speed scientific speed dating, which was pretty fun um, to get to meet some of the students that are out there and hear some of their great ideas. That was really neat. Um, but in terms of research, I think it, it kind of fits with that same thing. Of, it's about the people. Um, and so for me, I'm really interested in how can I use VR to help people? Um, and so that's a big driving piece for my research. And so I'm specifically looking at, you know, what are, what are some pretty serious um, behavior issues that we can tackle? So how can you tackle racism? How can you tackle stereotype threat? How can you increase diversity? How can you increase um, the number of people who are going into STEM so that we can build better, better equipment, better software, um, and just have use get a diverse group of people to get together to build better things? Yes, I completely agree with uh, what Tabitha said, both from the side of uh, missing the physical interaction with people and also in the direction that our lab is doing, is going. We are doing a lot of work on the uh, yeah, use of sound also to help like hearing in, hearing impaired people and also using VR for mental and physical disabilities. So it's, uh, we are going much more on, in the direction of uh, applied research rather than, uh, rather than basic research. Also, we have a project with uh, uh, now some colleagues on Mar on using eye tracking for people with a, a physical disability in order to play different uh, uh, virtual reality musical instruments. So this is the, it's also much more uh, rewarding, I would say, to exactly help people and work for people. And also mm -hmm. I have to say from the sound point of view, we have some uh, very big competitors in the basic research side, like companies like Facebook and so on, they are hiring 300 people to make a very, solid uh, tools. So from the basic research point of view, it's a bit hard to compete with or to keep uh, the, yeah, the level of uh, those uh, machines. 
Awesome. Well, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us here to be able to do a little bit of the IEEE VR wrap up and to, you know, talk about some of the highlights and some of the things that you're taking away from the conference. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed attending as well. And, you know, like I said, at the top, there's a videos that are available for people to go watch. Uh, if you go to IEEEVR.org slash 2021 and go to the uh, sort of overview section, then you can start to click in and find the different uh, videos. There's a, a YouTube channel, IEEE VR on YouTube where all the videos are located. Also on Twitch, they had Twitch streams and some of the, the VODs are available there. And um, yeah, just uh, thanks to the XR Bootcamp for helping to pull all these folks together and to organize it and to, uh, yeah, just to kind of wrap up our time at IEEE VR 2021. So thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, Thank Ken you. and all the panelists here yeah. uh, for, for joining today. Uh, we have still a few questions. We have, uh, actually our team is right now writing the link for those who wants to continue the discussion and uh, we, we are happy to continue the discussion and even answer the, some, uh, some of the other left questions if possible. So um, thank you again for making an amazing event of IEEEVR first of all, and joining to the recap uh, right afterwards. I, I hope that it's also beneficial for, for the audience as well. And we hope to see everyone in IEEEVR 2022. Uh, we are really looking forward to what kind of uh, different uh, projects and research papers will be and workshop um, uh, projects will be submitted. And thank you everyone for joining us today and see you in the next open lecture. Bye. Bye everybody.